Welcome everyone and, uh, and welcome to EMCA's Hellenic Orphans Taken Abroad from 1821 through the 1960s panel discussion. My name is Lou Katzos, uh, the East Mediterranean Business Culture Alliance's president, and I will be moderating today's panel. Our distinguished panel for this event includes Professor Gonda Van Steen, the Korais Chair of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, and the Director of the Center for Hellenic Studies at uh, King's College in London. We have historian, educator, author, Dr. Konstantin Hadzidimitriou, and Dr. Theodosius Kiriakidis, the Chair of Pontic Studies in the School of History and Archaeology at Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. The etymology of the word orphan is Hellenic from the uh, word orphanos, a Romanized orphanos, and is a child whose parent or parents have died, are unknown, or permanently have abandoned them. The causes for orphans uh, are many, wars, genocide, economic problems, cultural stigmas, social chaos, natural disasters and plagues, and was used in the past to describe children who lost their father before pu puberty and with other definitions uh, over time. Over the last 200 years uh, that our panel discussion covers, the causes outlined have created tens of thousands of orphans and sometimes in one occurrence alone, as for example, the Hughes massacre in April, 1822, which also resulted in over 50,000 deaths. In this panel discussion, the topic of Hellenic orphans and some not really so uh, by our definitions brought over to America from the Hellenic revolution and others to the Cold War period will be discussed. Due to the enormity of this uh, Hellenic orphans uh, topic, our panel discussion will focus on three areas and time periods. The first being on the Hellenic revolution of 1821 orphans that were brought to America, and that will be discussed by Dr. Hadzi Dimitriou. Second, the Hellenic genocide period on the orphans of the Pontic genocide, where a part uh, for those that were left in institutions in Turkey and ended up, in, uh, um, and ended up as uh, uh, Turks uh, in some cases, and others that were rescued by uh, missionaries and some that ended up uh, in the US will be discussed by Dr. Kiriakidis. The third, the Hellenic Cold War period orphans that were brought abroad, abroad to America and other countries in the 1950s and 1960s will be discussed by uh, Professor Gonda Van Steen. We hope, um, we hope this discussion uh, and conversation contributes to a wave of research and continues and continuous discussions on this very important topic, but not often and by, uh, by most rarely ever discussed. Uh, one of the things that I found uh, in putting this together is in fact, uh, there's a lot of research uh, that has not been done. And again, we hope the, uh, this event uh, contributes uh, you know, to that particular uh, research. Uh, we, we may have, uh, during this discussion, also uh, Congressman Belarakis. He's not with us right now. So we're going to start uh, uh, the presentations. And I'd like to introduce our first uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Konstantin Hadzidimitriou. Uh, Dr. Hadzidimitriou was born in uh, New York City and holds a PhD from uh, Columbia University in Byzantine, Ottoman, and Balkan history. While in Athens as a, as a Gennadios uh, fellow, he discovered the lost manuscript of the Chronicle of Galaxidi. And while there, he became the educational counselor of the US consulate and Fulbright office in Thessaloniki. Uh, the headmaster of Anato uh, Anatolia College's English uh, Language uh, Center and served as an assistant professor at the American uh, College. Later back in uh, the United States, uh, he was assistant to the Dean, Director of Admissions and Director of the Grants Development Program at LaGuardia Community College, uh, CUNY. 
uh, was on the uh, superintendent's staff in Community School District 30 and served as director of, the, of grants development. During that period, uh, Dr. Hadzi Dimitriou secured over $40 million in government grant funds to help implement innovative educational programs. Uh, and he has held the position of senior grants officer at, at Region 3 in, uh, in Queens. Uh, among the, his many awards and citations are Hellenic Educator of the Year, two Queens Borough President Citations for Excellence in Community Education, recognition by uh, President Clinton for his contributions to scholarship on the history of, of Greek-American relations, yeah. and uh, the I, can, I was, I could hear it, but then it... Uh... Okay. Oh, good. I think the congressman is with us. That's okay. That's let enough me, about let, me, uh, Luke. No, no. Let me let me continue. <laughs> let me continue. The congressman, the congressman okay. will, you know, will work it up. Uh, and we're going through the awards. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hadzi Dimitriou is also the author of two Hello, books. Hello. I, I don't hear you, though. Uh, okay. Uh, I, can, I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Okay, great, uh, Congressman. Just just one second, if you can if you can wait, because I'm introducing one of the panelists. If it's okay, uh, uh, Dr. Hansi Demetrio is the author of two books: American uh, Accounts uh, Documenting the Destruction of Smyrna, and founded on uh, Freedom and Virtue documents illustrating the impact of the United States of the Greek War of Independence. In addition to the many articles uh, in scholarly journals in the fields of Byzantine and modern. Hellenic history and education. Uh, he has taught at uh, Columbia University, the New School of Social Research, Bank Street College, St. John's University, the University of Thessaloniki, and uh, numerous uh, uh, city university of New York uh, colleges. Uh, welcome, Constantine. But Constantine, before, I, yes. I did a great introduction, but since we got- Move along. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. It's since okay. We got the, since we got the congressman on board, uh, congressman, what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, the various presenters, uh, you know, uh, speak on the different periods of uh, uh, relating to the orphans. But what I'll do is, if it's okay, before I introduce Constantine again uh, to uh, go through his presentation, I'm going to introduce you, and if you can, say a few words for us. So okay, okay, so. Here we go. Uh, Congressman uh, Gus Bilarakis uh, was a little bit late, but that's okay. Uh, Ignore me. <laughs> Greek time. Greek time. I try not to, but it's uh, it's in our uh, DNA. Ignore <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> Congressman uh, Gus Bilarakis represents uh, Florida's uh, 12th congressional district. Uh, he was first elected to Congress in 2006 and serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Veterans Affairs Committee. He is the ranking member of the VA Economic Opportunities Subcommittee and a member of the VA Disabilities Assistance and Memorial Affairs, Health Subcommittee and Communications and Technology Subcommittee. With 27 bills he authored, signed into law between 2015 and 2018, Congressman Bilarakis uh, was recently designated as the most effective lawmaker in the, in the state of Florida by the Center for Effective law, Lawmaking at Vanderbilt University. He is the grandson of Hellenic immigrants. Uh, his grandfather owned a local uh, bakery in Florida where he worked uh, at a young, from a young age. In other words, he was violating all the laws uh, relating to young people working, as I did and some of us also did. Well, the statute of limitations <laughs> is over with, so we're okay. <laughs> he attended the University of Florida where he graduated with a degree in political science and received his JD degree from Stetson University College of Law in, uh, in 1989. Uh, as a former member of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs and current member of the Caucus on International Religious Freedom, Congressman Bilarakis' uh, desire to support American allies, protect religious freedom, among many other things, has kept him strongly apprised of major world events. As the grandson of Hellenic immigrants, Congressman Bilarakis has been heavily invested in Hellenic affairs and the region which is vital to American interests and as the Hellenic Republic is and has been a strong ally of the United States. He is the co-chair of the uh, Congressional uh, Caucus uh, on uh, Hellenic Affairs. And we also had, just so you know, Congressman, in the last event that we had, uh, cultural event, we had also Congresswoman uh, Maloney 
uh, with us uh, discussing Helene's and Phil Helene's uh, Women uh, During the uh, Revolution and is the wow. founding co-chair of the Congressional Hellenic Israel Alliance on Israel, uh, also as a, as a strategic ally in the region as well, sharing a common defense uh, strategy with the United States, Greece, Cyprus, and other allies in the East Mediterranean. Uh, Congressman Belarakis has worked and continues to work with world leaders to, in, to ensure a peaceful future uh, in the Middle East and at home. Congressman Belarakis, Welcome aboard and say a few words before we start the panel discussion. Okay, so so how do you start? Uh, doctor, thank you for having me on. Uh, these are very, these issues uh, are, for me, I'm very fascinated with these issues. Now, the, the issue today uh, with the, the orphans uh, fascinates me as well. Now, you know, I'm not well versed on the topic. I don't think you expected me to be, but uh, I'm very interested in learning. Uh, anything having to do with our Hellenes, uh, our history, uh, of course, current events, but also future events. Uh, I, you mentioned my grandfather uh, running a, a Greek bakery in Tarpon Springs for many, many years. Uh, that's where I really learned the church. Uh, and of course, we have cultural events, but really waiting on the customers and uh, learning the glossa, uh, the traditions. Uh, yeah, it stuck with me throughout the years, and uh, and it was the greatest experience you could ever have. Uh, really, uh, every morning I was like a cafeño, and uh, people would come and around the table when my grandfather would make the the bread and and the cookies and what have you, and then waiting on the customers in the afternoon. Uh, it was it was a wonderful experience for me. I, I've always I feel we have a duty. Uh, and, and of course, it's a passion of mine uh, to protect uh, our Lada, our Kipro, and our Patriot Hill. But I'm very, very fascinated, and we can learn so much from history, but I'm fascinated uh, with our history, uh, particularly uh, the, the Greek War of Independence, 1821, and, and, and going forward. As a matter of fact, I've been trying to, for years uh, I know it's very difficult. Maybe somebody can help me out. My mother's last name is uh, Miaulis, her maiden name. And of course, you know, that was a great admiral, Andreas Vokos Miaulis. Uh, and I've been trying to find a link uh, to his we're, family we're, for many we're, years. We're going to find you the link because a lot of the people, not, we're not going to discuss it right now, but we're, we're yeah. also involved in genealogy, Hellenic genealogy. Oh, my so goodness. We'll, I would love we'll, that. We'll, we'll More get than some people We'll get some people on board to immediately, uh, you know, search out your history. But anyway, I'm sorry, Congressman, please. Well, no, 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 no. My, my grandparents are from the island of Galimnos. My mom, my wife's family is from Epiros. So uh, we have the whole, uh, the, all of Greece. I love Greece uh, and, and uh, particularly our, our heritage, our customs, our traditions. And, uh, you know, we've been very active, as you know, with the Hellenic Caucus. I'm not going to talk much longer because I want to listen. Uh, but I may have some questions. Uh, OK, you know, you know what? Save the questions for the period yeah, when we're going to have the, the discussion. But let me let me add a couple of things in terms okay. of this particular topic. OK, yes. So we have, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Konstantin uh, Dimitriou, who will discuss the Hellenic orphans uh, that were brought to the United that were brought to the United States during the Hellenic Revolution. Yeah, that's that's to me that's incredible. I've never heard anything about that. Yeah, so so we'll we'll he's going to come on board right now. So you'll be fascinated by that. Absolutely. You'll be fascinated by the discussion of uh, of uh, Doctor uh, Kiriakidis, who's going to discuss the Hellenic genocide orphans. And we know you've done a lot of work in Congress relating relating to those orphans. Absolutely. And then, and then we're going to have Professor Gwanda Van Steen. And, and Gonda is going to be discussing uh, orphans, or maybe not so, that were brought to the United States, uh, many of them not knowing that they were Greek. And you yeah. can be, in, you, after you listen to that fascinating discussion, you may be able to help actually in Congress to see if we can get some support for those orphans that in fact were brought into the United States and only now are discovering their Hellenic roots. With that, we're going to go to Constantine. Constantine. We cut off your, your wonderful that's, bio. That, that's fine. But, that's but, fine. Ignore me, Constantine. It's, it's no, too no, much. No, don't worry about it. it it's too, too long a bio. I'll have to, you know, give you less next time. 
Oh, I didn't think why... you were going to use it all. No, no, no. <laughs> that's why I had a long bio. So if we're interrupted, you'll have that great introduction. Okay. Uh, Constantine, tell us, tell us about the orphans, uh, you know, or not right. so... It's, in terms of the revolution, please. Uh, first of all, the topic uh, is framed chronologically. Um, uh, what uh, I'm dealing with is I'm dealing with uh, those that were uh, that came to America uh, from uh, Greece during the war. In other words, 18 from 1821 uh, to uh, uh, 1829. Uh, there were others who came afterwards, but that they're, they're outside of my chrono chronological uh, framework. Now. Um, the first uh, question I um, will address, and uh, the way I'm, uh, I don't know if I'll have enough time. You'll have to let me know uh, when I'm about five minutes left. I'm, I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring the hook and take you out. You're the the hook. Cool. Give me the hook. Right. Um, uh, I, um, I'm, uh, the approach I'm taking is I'm going to tell you first how I got involved with this subject. And then, um, because it's interrelated to the subject, and then I'm going to talk about the state of the research, what we know, what we don't know. Um, and so the, the yes. nice questions we need to ask no. concerning this subject, uh, and then the kinds of sources that are available uh, to address those kinds of questions. So how did I get involved in this subject? Well, one thing um, that I, I always uh, say in whenever I deal with anything um, related to Greek America uh, is uh, the, I have um, uh, three friends uh, one, uh, fortunately, has passed away, uh, Aristides Karadzas, who worked with me on uh, the uh, uh, Freedom and Virtue book. Uh, but um, uh, Steve Frangos, uh, who writes for the uh, National Herald, uh, and uh, Dan Drajakis, they are um, the um, authorities on in their respective areas in terms of Greek American history and Greek American studies. And they've been very generous and supported and giving me material over the years. Frangos in particular uh, writes these um, just incredible articles, uh, very well documented on uh, 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 Greek, uh, Greek American subjects of the 19th century. So I, I strongly advise everybody to uh, uh, get a hold of them and, and read them. Now, as you uh, know, this year uh, begins the 200 year uh, anniversary of 1821, the uh, Greek uh, War of Liberation. Um, I wrote a, a, a book along with Karatsis uh, to celebrate the 175th anniversary, which was in 1996. Uh, it didn't appear until 2002, but the book was uh, a collection of documents and we um, did kind of extensive uh, work on it, uh, collecting uh, the documents that, we, uh, that were available and uh, all we can do is selections and uh, try to analyze uh, America's involvement in uh, the, uh, the the War of 1821. Among those materials were some materials related to uh, these uh, uh, so-called orphans. Uh, uh, Christopher Castanis and uh, Perdicaris, um, Evangelides, uh, and others appear in uh, brief form in that particular volume. So um, that's my connection uh, to the subject. Uh, and um, that book uh, appeared uh, in, uh, uh, quite some time ago, 2002, and I had left it aside until um, recently. What happened was uh, the University of uh, Michigan contacted me and they wanted to digitize it for the um, 1821 celebration. So I want your audience to know that the, 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 they don't have to go out and look for the book. It's available to everybody listening online for free. So if you're interested in looking at various documents and an overview of uh, America's involvement in the war, you just go to, um, to uh, it's the Hathi uh, Trust, uh, and uh, you can um, uh, download the entire book or uh, look at it, et cetera. And I wrote some other uh, things supplementing that book uh, subsequently. So that's one connection. The other connection was years ago, uh, it's it's uh, it's a little frightening to remember how long ago it was. Um, I worked on a, um, a a book having to do with the Greek community of New York, uh, and uh, that appeared in 1992. And when I worked on that, um, uh, the um, uh, thing that I discovered was I discovered that the New York Historical Society had an unpublished manuscript of one of these so-called orphans. 
uh, a fellow by the name of Evangelides. Um, Christodoulos, uh, uh, he, he calls himself Christodoulos Leonidas Miltiades Evangelides. Now, that's a mouthful, folks. Uh, uh, he was um, William Cullen Bryant's Greek boy. And you, you see here on the screen uh, a, a contemporary rendition of him. And uh, if, if Evangelides um, has left us a diary. Uh, the diary is from uh, the uh, 1830s, uh, from 1834 to 1840. And to my knowledge, it's the earliest Greek American diary uh, in existence. Uh, I don't think any, any, any uh, other diary has been found uh, from that period. And it's a diary of one of these uh, so-called orphans that, was, that came over during that period. So it's, it's a fascinating source because it gives us firsthand insight into the day-to-day -day life of one of these uh, individuals and um, uh, uh, how they uh, uh, negotiated American society uh, at the time. Um, I was able to get that uh, microfilmed, so it's available to others with scholarship, uh, for scholarship. Uh, and um, I uh, wrote an article, uh, a detailed article about Evangelides in uh, 2004. Uh, and um, uh, that uh, is uh, one of the most detailed, uh, or probably the most detailed account of that particular uh, uh, orphan, so-called orphan. We know he wasn't an orphan, although he appears in a lot of the literature as an orphan, because at, when I was reading the diary at one point, he tells us that he uh, uh, went uh, to the uh, equivalent of the post office to write a letter to his mother uh, and his sister. So uh, we know that at least he had one parent uh, and um, the, they then later on subsequent to this, the other um, diary uh, that we have from Evangelides is at Harvard. And that's from the um, uh, 1850s. Uh, he was um, a fascinating individual because he, uh, as you saw, uh, dressed in a fustanella uh, in Greek uh, costume. and um, went around giving lectures and was uh, what I called a super patriot. Uh, he went to Columbia College uh, and um, uh, was the first Greek uh, to graduate from Columbia College. Uh, and in fact, uh, a Greek sea captain uh, was on the stage with him when uh, he was uh, at, uh, at Columbia College for the commencement uh, ceremony. So um, uh, I have um, those uh, sources that I mentioned and then recently, the Heans have published a book which we used uh, for the uh, Freedom and Virtue book, but they uh, reprinted it of uh, Christophorus uh, Castanis. Now, he's the only other firsthand detailed source that we have um, by one of these uh, uh, orphans. Uh, uh, Castanis uh, came over, um, and he's very interesting. That's what the book looks like. Uh, and um, that uh, cover is, is uh, a, um, a, a contemporary sketch of him. Uh, I have the, uh, the original book, and what the um, uh, Keans did was they made uh, the text available, and they took that, um, that uh, contemporary rendition and uh, colorized it and uh, made it a little more attractive. So uh, that's available uh, as well. So then... Uh, uh, I've been contacted to write something on these orphans, and I began to look at the research um, on these individuals. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's interesting, the number that's always given uh, is uh, 40. Uh, the claim is made that there were 40 uh, of these uh, orphans that were uh, brought uh, to the United States. Now, as I mentioned to you, um, uh, Evangelides was not an orphan. Um, but uh, and in addition, uh, Castanis wasn't an orphan either. We know that his, uh, he tells us in his book that he went back to Greece and he found his mother uh, and his sister and so on and so forth. So neither one of them were without parents. But some uh, who were brought over uh, uh, had parents and others did not. In fact, some uh, that were um, uh, sent over uh, were encouraged by their parents to come over for a number of reasons, which is rather interesting. So um, we don't have a, um, uh, a, um, a comprehensive study at all 
of these um, 1821 uh, refugees. I like to call them all refugees because they were all refugees. Some were orphans and some were not orphans. So I like the term refugees. So they were definitely refugees. And uh, uh, the um, uh, massacre at Hios uh, that uh, Lou uh, mentioned uh, was an impetus for a lot of them to be taken uh, to the United States, to come to the United States. Um, and uh, uh, if you look at the range of, uh, of, of individuals, they come from all over Greece, but there's definitely a core from Hios. So uh, there were a large number, a uh, significant number, I would say, that came from, uh, from, from Hios. So um, what we have uh, is we have a lot of different um, individuals that are talked about in the literature. Uh, and some of them became very famous in America. Um, I, I'll call out um, uh, one uh, uh, they, who was a professor for 44 years at Harvard, uh, Professor uh, Sophocles. Uh, he um, uh, really uh, was one of the uh, uh, proponents of uh, Greek language and Byzantine language and literature. Uh, he was at Harvard uh, for 44 years. There he is, kind of a severe looking uh, individual uh, and um, very, very uh, interesting uh, life. Uh, he um, uh, lived in one room. Uh, he was um, a, a wonderful teacher, uh, rather severe with uh, his students, although he could be very kind. Uh, he, uh, he published, uh, a multi-volume dictionary of uh, uh, Byzantine Greek in English in the 1800s. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to tell you, it's still the only dictionary uh, that we have. Uh, there's the Thesaurus Linguae Greek Greci project, which um, uh, has uh, you know Byzantine texts and so on. Gandhi's familiar with uh, this material as well. But uh, Sophocles' dictionary is really the only you know uh, reference work in English that we have uh, for uh, the range of, uh, of of literature. He uh, he's a colorful individual. lived in one room, kept chickens in um, uh, in his room. Uh, who he named after his colleagues at Harvard. Just imagine, and uh, he would say, "Oh, that's uh, so and so plucking away," and that's so and so. He he um uh, he he came to America. Uh, and um, uh, he, um, uh, 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 his father uh, um, uh, had died. Uh, he was very close to his uncle. He spent time in, um, in uh, Mount Sinai at the monastery and maintained contact with the monks. I know uh, that he, his mother was alive because, and he had a, a very interesting sense of humor. He went to a trip. He was from Pilion, a Chorio outside of Pilion, actually. Uh, and uh, if you've ever been there, it's kind of an interesting area. Uh, and uh, he studied with some great um, scholars in Greece. Uh, and as I said, he kept chickens. And when he went back to his Chorio on a, on a trip, uh, when he came back to Harvard, um, uh, one of his colleagues asked him, uh, how did you find your mother? And he said, oh, uh, up an apple tree. So uh, he, he definitely had a living mother when he went back and, and visited. So he was not uh, an orphan, but he's a colorful character and a great scholar. And um, one interesting thing about him is that he also uh, championed Demotic Greek. Now this is in the 1800s, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when uh, Demotic Greek was not the fashion. Uh, and um, he went against uh, the conventions of his time. Um, so we, um, uh, uh, what we have is we have a lot of uh, brief studies of individuals like uh, Sophocles, like um, uh, uh, others, uh, and we don't have a study of all of these uh, so-called orphans as a group. Uh, in fact, we're not even sure how many there are. Uh, and I'll tell you, um, as I mentioned, Steve Frangos has published lots of interesting uh, articles uh, in the National Herald on these individuals based on very reliable uh, sources. Unlike what you find on the internet, uh, very often you find what I like to call in Greek, pasalimata. Uh, you find, uh, you know, people are copying things and pasting things and so on. And uh, when you look at the, what, what it's based on, people repeat the same uh, errors over and over again. 
Now, uh, Frangos has also written a, um, uh, a, um, uh, an article uh, about uh, someone called Nick Magnatis. Uh, came over in 1828, totally absent from the literature. The reason why uh, Steve did that was he wanted to demonstrate how uh, there are, are so many others it, uh, that are part of this group uh, that came over during the uh, uh, revolution, uh, the War of Liberation, that are totally unknown. Uh, so we know uh, about some individuals, uh, but we, we, we haven't uh, even scratched the surface of how many they are. And so Steve uh, traces this guy, Magnatis, uh, who ended up having a, um, an official position in Michigan. He started off as a druggist, uh, and then he's a doctor, uh, and then um, he, he does all kinds of interesting things. He had a daughter. Um, he did not go back to Greece, and some of these orphans went back to Greece. Some of them uh, stayed and settled in America, married Americans, and uh, had a, a family. Uh, Magnatis had a daughter who was uh, a well-known writer, uh, and um, you could look it up online. Luckily, the National Herald has created, a, again, a free archive of all of this stuff. So you can um, download and look at uh, Fragus' articles on uh, these various individuals, both uh, for the so-called orphans and uh, on 19th century Greek America in general. Now, um, as I was preparing, for this um, uh, presentation, I went back and looked at uh, a, uh, a volume that I had uh, about the American philanthropic effort. effort. One of the important things uh, related to all of this was uh, the United States, uh, they not only um, uh, sent res did resolutions and uh, sent money uh, across uh, uh, through England to help uh, the combatants in Greece, uh, Daniel Webster, uh, Jefferson, uh, uh, his relationship with Corais. There were all these relations that we wrote about in uh, Freedom uh, uh, and Virtue, uh, the book. But um, what is not recognized and needs more study and elaboration is that the United States uh, uh, went through a period uh, that's uh, in the literature called uh, Greek fever or Greek fire where uh, unlike uh, the government, which made a lot of uh, good statements and good feeling statements, the, uh, the public um, by the thousands uh, around the country, uh, but particularly in the Northeast, raised the equivalent of millions of dollars in um, uh, uh, supplies, uh, food, clothing, uh, et cetera, and sent uh, this um, uh, aid to Greece. What they did was they not only sent it um, uh, through others, they actually put it on ships uh, and they had these committees and uh, the women were heavily involved as well. And they held balls, they held uh, various lectures, various events everywhere. Um, uh, African-Americans uh, took an active part. In addition, uh, they, uh, uh, it was very widespread uh, movement this, um, this uh, uh, outpouring of uh, support for the, uh, the Greeks fighting for their freedom uh, captured really the imagination of the, uh, of the whole country. And these boatloads of supplies were sent to Greece and uh, there were a small number of volunteers. Uh, the most notable were Jarvis, Howe, Samuel Gridley, Howe, famous guy, and, um, and uh, uh, Miller. Uh, the three of them uh, helped supervise uh, the distribution of these uh, supplies. Uh, and the committees that sent them over uh, also would send them over with a, a person supervising them. So these people who went over with the ships then uh, supervised the distribution because um, remember, this is a, a time where people are starving. There's a war going on. So um, the uh, Greek government sometimes tried to skim off and take some of these supplies. Individual um, uh, fighters and, and leaders uh, tried to uh, take some of them. At one point, Kolokotronis himself uh, took some of the supplies off one of the ships and um, Howe had to uh, call in an American warship 
uh, to uh, uh, intimidate them and get uh, a large portion of the uh, foodstuffs uh, back. Con so Con Constantine, I, I, don't want, I don't want to cut you off, but if, if we can, uh, let me just mention a few things about some of the orphans also. Uh, and we'll come back. We'll come back to sure. we'll come back to the issue. For the, for those who are listening, uh, understand that when we talk about orphans, there was a different definition in the past. It had to do with the loss of a father. So sometimes when we say they're not orphans, it, it has to do with with definitions. I will say that Evangelides did go back to Greece. Uh, the Greek boy, what was known as the Greek boy, he did right. found uh, a very famous school, the Greek Lyceum, right. which taught hundreds of students, quite frankly, and it was very famous. Uh, there was also there was also uh, not only uh, uh, boys but also girls. Uh, one of them was uh, right. Garifalla, Garifalla, uh, very, uh, very Mohabi, who came in uh, 1827. Her parents uh, were murdered in Chios, and uh, she was adopted by the Langton family in the United States. She died young. She died in 1830, but poems and songs were written about her. And as a matter of fact, U.S. ships were named after Garifalla. That's right. And many and many young girls were actually in America were named after her. And uh, multi generation, if you see an old name of Garifalla in America, it usually relates relates to her. Samuel Gridley Howe uh, brought back uh, three. Uh, three orphans, uh, orphans, not orphans. One of them was Yanni Zahos, who was very famous, uh, a very famous uh, orator. Uh, he ended up in uh, Cooper Union. Uh, again, we'll discuss him in the future relating to abolitionism and all types of other issues. Uh, he, brought, he brought back also uh, a, a young lady called Sophia, but we don't know what happened to Sophia. No one, no one really knows. Right. Uh, for the Congressman, if he's there, Congressman, you'll love this. Uh, uh, Jonathan Miller, who fought in the Greek Revolution, who went to Greece, he was an abolitionist, a famous abolitionist. He brought, he brought back a young man by the name of Lucas Miltiades. Lucas Miltiades, who took on the name Miller, became the first Hellenic American congressman in the United States of America. So that's important. And then, and then I'll just fi I'll finalize this before we go into the next topic. But Am I running out of time? No, no, no. But uh, when uh, Constantine was talking about the ships, one of the ships that came and was delivering supplies in secret, a congressman, was the USS, was the USS, um, the USS, what's the most famous ship in the United States, guys, in Boston? Constitution. The USS Constitution was delivering supplies in Greece. They weren't supposed to be uh, delivering because of the Monroe Doctrine. But oh, one of the interesting things was, listen to this, Congressman. They picked up, they picked up one of these young people, the mother, who her family had been killed, her brothers had been, uh, her brothers had been killed, her children had been killed except one child. She turned it over. They don't know how the, the child got into the USS Constitution, but because they didn't want to reveal that, that it was one of the children of Hios, what hmm. they did was they immediately signed up the child as being, as being a member of the ship. And he was actually operating as a ship boy in uh, the USS Constitution. Now, Constantine, what was the name of that youth? I, th I think you're talking about George uh, Syrian. Exactly. So who became a gunner? Who became a gunner? Now, mention one more name, and then we'll go into the in, into the next phase. Mention Yorgos Kalavorkazis. Right. Uh, <laughs> he uh, he became very famous. He also uh, came and joined the Navy. Uh, and what happened with him was that he was part of, I think it was Perry, uh, that uh, they uh, circumnavigated uh, the world. He was part of that expedition. Uh, and uh, uh, he wrote a book about, and they, uh, they explored, they were the first to explore Antarctica. And he wrote a book about all of his experiences. But also what also did he do? Civil what War. also did he do? He was an abolitionist and he served in the, right. in the, in the Civil War. And, wow. and what was he? He was a captain of a ship. Exactly. Well, they, and he should have been, as you say, an admiral. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, the, um, his son uh, subsequently became, also joined the Navy, had a very distinguished career, and became an admiral. And um, in uh, a detailed article that Eva Topping has written about him, uh, it turns out that uh, he was actually blocked from advancement. He should have been advanced, but uh, it's an example of uh, even though 
these individuals uh, started at the very top of American society because they were brought over by very influential people and, um, and given very high level educations, not available to immigrants usually, they, um, there was still some bias. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Evangelides, when he came back uh, in the 1850s, uh, he was accused of being a foreign agent and not American. And he had to write uh, and, and, and explain that he was in fact an American and loyal to the United States. In fact, he represented uh, the United States before the United States had official consuls uh, out of Syria. So uh, on the one hand, these immigrants did very well and became uh, very famous. I mean, one of them became a congressman. Uh, we have many other examples. A lot of them became very wealthy. Uh, some of them went back and forth. But uh, there was also an undertone of uh, a bias and, and prejudice against foreigners. And there was always a, a group uh, in America that was pro-Turkish, uh, particularly for commercial reasons. Uh, and uh, we can talk a little bit about that later. We'll, we'll get into that. In, we'll what, into time, that what, time period, what time period would you say that was? And uh, I know the Kyotists are pretty exceptional people, particularly their seafaring people. Yeah, you, you know um, what? We'll, we'll, get, we'll, get back to the, okay. we'll get back to that conversation later. Right. But let, okay. me, let, me, let me add that that time period started, started even before the Greek Revolution. But we'll discuss that later. Yeah. Well, with Matt Constantine, thank you so much. Uh, there's so much that has to be uh, researched with regards to these orphans. Some of them, as you know, as, and as you said, became very famous. Some of them became very wealthy, among the most wealthiest people in the world. The Raleigh's. Some of them were the, were the Raleigh's brothers who came here as orphans in the United States. But let's go now to, to the, the second part of, uh, of our discussion. And uh, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the Pontic uh, orphans and I have the uh, distinct pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Uh, Theodosius Kyriakidis. Dr. Kyriakidis holds a PhD in modern history at the University of Western Macedonia, Greece. He graduated from the Faculty of Theology at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and attended courses at the, uh, I'm not gonna mention the German name because I can't pronounce it. Uh, he participated uh, in the uh, European program Eras Erasmus Socrates. He also received a diploma in Greek pa paleography and uh, a master's degree in historical theology. He is an alumnus of the Genocide and Human Rights University program organized by the International Institute uh, for, for uh, Genocide and Human Rights Studies and, and the History Department of the University of Toronto. Moreover, uh, moreover uh, he has conducted postdoctoral research at the uh, La Spanzia University of Rome. In addition to Greek, he speaks English, Italian, and German. He has conducted extensive research in Greece and abroad and has been awarded scholarships from some, uh, for, from, uh, some famous institutions, uh, including uh, the Vatican, uh, the Holy Synod of the Church of Greece, and the Aristotle University at Thessaloniki. Uh, he is currently a research fellow uh, at the chair for Pontic Studies at Aristotle University at Thessaloniki and a visiting lecturer at the International Hellenic University. Uh, University. Welcome, Theo, and uh, thank you for being with us and making this presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Lou. I would like to begin by expressing my warmest uh, thanks and congratulations to the organizers of this panel the East Mediterranean Business Cultural Alliance, and particularly to you, uh, Lou, and uh, your collaborators. Um, at the beginning of today's presentation, uh, let me emphasize from the outset that the orphans uh, we are referring to emerge as a consequence of the genocidal policies of the Young Turks and the Kemalists. Uh, that is the, the systematic attempt to exterminate a target group in this case, the Greeks of Pontus and Asia Minor. Uh, there is no time here to refer to the historical events that led to the genocide, but we can give the geographical and chronological context. Now, we are essentially talking about the persecutions of the Greek populations from Eastern Thrace and Asia Minor in 1913, and, and especially 1914. And the persecutions continued with the Greeks of Pontus 
and lasted till the end of 1922, 1920, early 1923. The program of persecutions included violent expulsions and deportations, boycott, massacres, and looting. It is also important to emphasize here that uh, all of the above happened before Greece entered the First World War. Contrary to what Turkish historiography often claims, that is that uh, the events took place during, the, during military op uh, operations. So most of the events, the massacres happened before Greece entered the First World War, and this is important. The persecutions of the Greeks of Asia Minor and Eastern Thrace preceded the Armenian genocide and were a precursor and guide to the extermination of the rest of the Christian communities of the empire. Of the empire. Um, as Bedribe, the police chief in Constantinople, admitted to one of Henry Morgenthau's secretaries. Uh, the genocide took place between 1914 and 1923 and was incited against all the Greeks of the Ottoman Empire. Therefore, the Pontus orphans we will talk about today are only part of the victims of this genocide. Now, the orphan children were the ones who survived after the systematic massacres of the civilian population uh, in towns and villages, or after the exhausting marches into the interior of the empire. Uh, the fate of these children can be divided into three main categories. The first case concerned those, uh, those children who, after the murder of their parents, wander abandoned here and there, hungry, sick, naked in the cold, uh, with the consequences, um, the consequence that they died helplessly from the hardships. Uh, such was the case with my maternal grandfather from Pafra, for example, Efrem Azoglu. Uh, while he was eight years old, he was dragged with his grandmother into exile and uh, on these death marches within the Ottoman Empire. He himself survived, and on the rare occasions he spoke about this exile, uh, he was describing the course of these unfortunate people with uh, torn clothes passing through the mountains from, the, from where the voices of, uh, he said, half dead children could be heard who were dying, abandoned, shouting, mother, mother. They were children who had been lost to their families and uh, unable to support themselves, were dying helplessly on the streets and in the mountains. This is the first um, uh, case of orphan uh, children. The second case was the orphan children who ended up in an orphanage. Uh, during that period, uh, we had uh, Christian orphanage, uh, orphanage uh, Orthodox, Evangelical, and Roman Catholic uh, orphanages operating in Pontus area. And the third case is the fate of orphan children, which is in fact a key, a key aspect of genocidal policy according to Article 2, Paragraph 5 of the Convention of the, on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of, uh, of Genocide uh, in 1948. Uh, that was the forced transfer of children of a group to another group. And that's what's happened with the, the orphans who remained in Turkish families or orphanages. orphanages. Uh, this measure was implemented on a large scale, scale in Turkey during the genocide, both individually as well as collectively. Many children uh, of Greek, uh, uh, as well as of Armenian, of course, and Assyrian families, were forcibly transferred to Muslim families, cutting them off from all their ethnic and religious affiliations. With the consequence, they uh, convert, converted to Islam and were, were raised like, uh, like Turks. So they were lost for the, Greek, uh, uh, for the Greeks. Uh, systematic collection of children, especially young ones, took place in Turkish orphanages from where children from Christian families were distributed uh, to Muslim families and was, were ra raised as a Muslim as, uh, as Turkish. Now, we leave the first case of children who died helplessly from hunger and misery, who after all, uh, it is impossible for us to follow their fate, but also to know how many they were. And uh, we are moving forward to see those children who ended up in the orphanages. 
Now, the first case concerns the Orthodox orphanages, uh, those established by the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the local metropolises. The Greek Orthodox community of the empire uh, had orphanages both in Constantinople and in the provinces in order to be able to serve the needs that uh, would arose during the genocide. After the first persecution in World War I, these charities increased in numbers. At the time of the genocide, central orphanages in uh, Istanbul existed in many, many areas of Istanbul, like Halki, Pringipo. There is this famous wooden building in uh, um, uh, Pringipo uh, and other places like Fanari, Diplokionio, and in other places in Istanbul. In addition, the Patriarchal uh, Central Committee for the Displaced Greek Population founded on November 22, 1918. Uh, uh, and uh, this, um, this committee also gathered uh, collected orphans. The orphans were collected from the local metropolises and the Orthodox communities and were ch uh, channeled to the orphanages of Constantinople and from there uh, from uh, Constantinople, they were sent to Greece, or in many cases, directly from the provinces. From the provinces, the children were sent uh, directly to Greece. Uh, and I will ask Constantinos to show the first uh, picture from the PowerPoint presentation. The next one. And the next one. Okay. Now in Pontos here, you see the orphanages in Pontos. Uh, some of the main orphanages. Uh, these orphanages had been established by the local metropolises and the Greek communities. And here, uh, indicatively, I mentioned uh, the towns, the cities. Uh, there were, were orphanages mainly in Kotiora, Sinopi, Bafra, Tokat, Trebizond, Giresun, Amisos, now Samson, Pulanzaki, Agdagmaten. From the numbers of orphans that you see uh, next to the cities, the name of the cities, one can understand that uh, what we know from other diplomatic sources, that in the Western Pontus, the genocide was more cruel than, than uh, uh, East Pontus. Now let's move to the... Uh, Next one. Here are some pictures from uh, uh, several uh, orphanages from Pontos. Um, you can we can move to the next one. Here are some orphans from uh, Merzifon. They were collect were being collected by the uh, missionaries that were running the the uh, Anatolia College at that time. Anatolia College was operating in uh, in uh, Merzifon. The next one. And again, here we can see uh, kitchen soup in uh, Samsung, and orphans uh, that were collected by the then Bishop uh, Germanos Karavangelis in Amasia. The next one. And now this is a, a Roman Catholic um, uh, orphanage in in uh, Samsung. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church was not very organized, nor did it have at its, uh, it, its disposal the multitude of charities and the money like the evangelic evangelicals. A Roman Catholic orphanage had existed in Trebizond since 1869, but with very few orphans. During the genocide, however, the orphans multiplied to such an extent that the small Catholic mission found it very difficult to serve them. Especially with the, with the end of the First World War, the Roman Catholic Church established a central orphanage, which was named after Pope Benedict XV, uh, Pope of, of that time. The children was made without religious uh, discrimination, although most of them concerned orphans of Armenian uh, origin. As in the Orthodox community, efforts were made to collect children from Turkish authorities and families, in order to save them from violent Islamization. Indeed, many children who were, were gathered in Turkish orphanages were registered under Muslim names. In fact, for the Turks, according to Catholic Roman Catholic records, 
children would either be forced to convert to Islam or starve to death. Uh, I quote, become Muslims and you will as much and you will have as much bread as you want. End of quote, they were told. And now let's move to the American evangelical orphanages and we can show also the next picture. America's reaction to the genocide of the Christian population of the Ottoman Empire was extremely dynamic. The widespread massacres of Armenians in 1915 mobilized a great wave of sympathy and fundraising, which grew all over the world and especially in the United States. From the fall of 1915, there was a systematic organization in the United States or by American organizations in other places to help Christians in the Near East. The various relief committees that were originally formed were united in November 1915 into an organization called the American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief. While aid was gathered in uh, several towns of the United States and distributed to the afflicted mainly by the vast uh, network of missionaries and school teachers. Gradually, other organization became, organizations became involved in the relief and rescue process. And we can uh, go to the next uh, slide. Uh, such as the YMCA or the American Red Cross. And especially for the Greeks, the Greek Relief Committee, which operated between 1917 to 1921 and worked with a network of missionaries and diplomats. American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief, which later included the Greeks, was renamed the well-known Near East Relief. In addition to the uh, above, uh, we have also other American organizations, independent and lesser known, like the American Women's Hospitals. Uh, and here we see the uh, chair, the president of this foundation, Esther uh, Lovejoy founded in 1911, based in New York. Thanks to this organization, uh, many orphans were saved from certain death. The American Red Cross, on the other hand, had produced a huge amount of uh, philanthropic work, largely re replacing governmental welfare services. And let's see how these orphans arrived in Greece. In Greece, the orphans were transported in an organized manner by boats that were chartered for this purpose. And after consultation with the authorities, they all ended up together in specific places. The most well-known areas of mass settlement of orphans are the cases of Syros, Corinth, Corfu, Kefalonia, Kavala, in various areas of Athens, such as Marathon, Zapion, and elsewhere. In Syros, Near East Relief settled about 2,500 orphans, and in Kavala until 1923, 2,000 children from Pontus and Asia Minor. In June, uh, Emma Kushman, in June 1923, we see Emma Kushman in the pictures here, a missionary and later Near East Relief associate brought 1,700 uh, orphan children to Corinth. In November 1922, the American Near East Relief Orphanage was established in Corfu, which included the children of orphanages uh, from Sebastia, Merzifun, and Amisos, and uh, came to feed about 3,000 orphans. More than, uh, uh, altogether, more than uh, 7,500 orphans were settled in Corfu. In, this, in those difficult years of the catastrophe, every place that could accommodate uh, the large populations of orphan children was sold. Even on Mount Athos, and here in the picture we see the um, um, correspondence between the nearest relief and the um, holy community of Mount Athos. So um, even on Mount Athos itself, we read through the archives of various monasteries that in November 1922, the authorities were looking for a place and a way for the orphans to settle there in Mount Athens. In a document of the Ecumenical Patriarchate on November 2, 1922, the Holy Community of Mount Athos was asked 
to help the government's proposal to settle orphans in areas in uh, several monasteries. In fact, for the organization of the installation of 15,000 orphans from Pontus, the American commissioner of Near East Relief, Gordon Berry, you can see him in this picture, uh, had planned to travel in Mount Athos in order to organize the installation of the orphans. Now, many of the orphans who arrived in Greece were taken care of, uh, especially the older ones, to be placed in rural families in order to support themselves by helping with agricultural work. Those orphans who were not lucky enough to be collected by the charitable organizations in order to come in an organized manner ended up together with the other refugees in the quarantine places in Macronisos, Calamaria, and elsewhere. These were unfortunate in their misfortune because living was uh, extremely difficult for them. We can get a picture of the Greek refugees from the Caucasus who came to Greece in the early 1920s at the urging uh, of the Greek state and uh, the then Venezuelan government. According to the open letter of the Committee for the Assistance of Ca Caucasian uh, Refugees, there were uh, 400 to 450 orphan minors aged 1 to 12 who were naked and uh, wearing rags. The drama of the orphaned uh, Caucasian ref refugees was briefly described in the press of the time. For example, newspaper Macedonia, Macedonia wrote that, I quote, we have before us 300 orphaned Caucasians, not just suffering, by, but dying of hunger and deprivation, end of quote. Um, and we can continue uh, with the pictures. We can see the next one. Uh, to conclude, let us refer to the third and the most tragic case of the orphaned Greek children, which concerned those who remained in Turkish families or Turkish orphanages and were raised as Muslims and Turks. We know from several sources that many orphaned Greek children ended up in Muslim homes and orphanages. Uh, where the Patriarchate was aware of such cases, uh, it proceeded to relevant protests to the Turkish authorities or to uh, foreign diplomatic missions, managing in many cases to detach the children and place them in Orthodox orphanages. During the protest of the Patriarchate, the Turkish government was, uh, uh, the Turkish regime at that time was sometimes forced to order the return of the orphans to the local ecclesiastical authorities. Often, however, despite the orders, the children were not given back to the Greek authorities. Uh, such cases were called upon uh, to deal the Patriarchal Central Committee that I referred earlier, uh, which with the help of foreign diplomatic authorities. Um, and with that help, they were able to remove orphans from uh, Muslim uh, orphanages and families and place them in the Orthodox orphanages of the provinces or uh, in the orphanages uh, in Istanbul. Um, we can continue with the pictures. Here, here you see uh, pictures from orphans uh, that are placed in Zapio Megaro, um, uh, in other places in, in Athens. Uh, again, from the same uh, area. The next one. Again. Okay. And the last one. Here, yes. Now, as I said, there are many cases of orphans left in Turkey, and from time to time, uh, various testimonies are recorded. The most famous cases are those recorded by writer and an amateur research researcher George Andreadis, uh, Tamama, uh, Tolika, and Thodoron, these uh, children who have left, bef uh, left bef behind in Turkey and raised up as, uh, as uh, Turks. Uh, Tamama became a bestseller and was translated in many languages, even in Chinese. And the story inspired a Turkish director who made a, a successful uh, film. Um, uh, with the title Waiting for the Clouds. Uh, now, the numbers. 
it is impossible to determine, uh, determine the exact number of orphan children as uh, many of them died in Turkey before coming to Greece or in quarantine uh, as soon as they arrived, arrived in Greece, uh, while others came to Greece with the rest of the refugees without going through the institutions. Now, there have been proposed numbers, uh, like uh, Andre Adis, for example, uh, noted that the American humanitarian services in Samsung had gathered uh, 25,000 Greek children. 10 of them were sent to childless American families, and uh, 15,000 through the patriarchate ended up in orphanages, mostly in the Ionian Islands. In total, however, it is estimated that from 1915 to 1913, mostly uh, what we call American care, rescued, cared for, and educated approximately 132,000 orphans, mainly Greek and, of course, Armenian uh, children. In the few minutes I had at my disposal, I tried to give an overview of the issue of orphans after the genocide. But the issue of orphans is complex and several other issues need to be addressed. Some of there are rivalry over orf orphans, like between evangelicals and Catholics, exploitation and abuse of the orphans in some cases. In some cases, adopting a girl was like recruiting uh, an unpaid maidservant, or in the cases of boys, a worker in the fields. Moreover, the diplomatic power of charity and uh, its consequent political exploitation is not a negl negligible uh, force. But these are concerns for another discussion. What should be noted here is that in those tragic moments of the catastrophe, thanks to the action of the above organizations, hundreds of thousands of souls were saved. Thank you very much. Theo, th thank you for that. I mean, it, uh, it's unbelievable, over 100,000. And, and you, you don't know how many, but, but chances are that number is low, quite frankly, that, that number is low. Thank you so much. And now for our, our final uh, presentation, before we start uh, having a, our, a little panel discussion, I want to introduce um, someone who's, uh, who, we, who, who many of us know very well, uh, who's a friend and who uh, I collaborated with originally uh, on this particular um, you know, event that we're having. And that's uh, Professor Gonda Van Steen. Uh, she holds a PhD in classics and Hellenic studies from Princeton University. She is a classical scholar and linguist who specializes in ancient and modern Greek language and literature. And since uh, 2018, she has held the Korais chair in the Center for Hellenic Studies and the Department of Classics at King's College uh, in London. Uh, she's the first woman to hold this position and she's the director of the Center for Hellenic Studies at King's, at King's College. She previously held the uh, Cassis Chair in Greek Studies at the University of Florida and taught at Cornell University and the University of Arizona. Uh, she has also served as the president of the Modern Greek Studies Association uh, uh, in, in the past from uh, uh, 2012 to 2014. She's the, she's the author of five books and her latest book, uh, Adoption, Memory and Civil War Greece, Kid uh, Pro Quo, uh, University of Michigan uh, Press. It just came out uh, within the last two years takes the, the reader into the uh, new uncharted terrain of Greek adoption that became uh, paradigmatic of Cold War politics and history. Uh, these adoptions from Greece to the US are among the uh, oldest and, uh, and fraught uh, post-war international adoptions. Uh, there were about 3,200 uh, children adopted between uh, 1948 uh, to 1962. And this topic merits uh, further study. Gonda, of course, has done in her book, I think, um, a historical study of this particular period. And, and we hope uh, through what we've heard today that uh, we have similar studies of uh, orphans in other periods. Gonda is currently working uh, on a book in which uh, the Greek adoptees to the US, but also to the ne Netherlands themselves, uh, lead to a narrative 
and it is long overdue. Uh, welcome, Gonda, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lou, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that you took it on to bring this historic continuum of orphanhood, Hellenic orphanhood together. I don't think these three episodes have ever been placed next to each other, and I find this a very special opportunity also to reacquaint with Constantine Gatsi Dimitriou, and uh, our paths have a way of crossing, which I always very much enjoy, and to make the acquaintance of Dr. Kiriakidis, and with Congressman Gus, Gus Bilirakis, we share being gators, which is a very strong bond. So, so lots of connections here, not just personal and very wonderful connections, but also thematic connections. I'm just struck by how some of these, these concepts that have already been raised will be coming back, including the definition of orphanhood. If I may rely on our wonderful Constantinos who's behind the scenes, to show us my short PowerPoint presentation. There are only 12 slides. I won't keep you long. I encourage people who are adopted from Greece in the 1950s and 60s to contact me. Uh, this is an ongoing project, even after the book that was published in 2019. In fact, because of the book, I feel that there is some sort of a whirlwind of discussion going on about being adopted from Greece to the US or to the Netherlands. So I, I very much encourage continued study and continued conversation on that subject. And you will see that I've illustrated my presentation with some key terms, but also with the covers of books that have been written by adoptees themselves. And I find that a very important chapter to the study that these people are uh, speaking out for themselves, and that phenomenon is as recent as 2011. So these people finding their own voices is not even 10 years old, despite the fact that some of these adoptions are actually 70 years old. So let's move on then. So we need to break down this movement of adoptions of Greek children uh, in two big uh, geographical areas, let's say, according to the destination. Between roughly 1950 and 1962, about 3,200 children go from orphanages all over Greece, but especially from Patras, to all of, uh, places all over the US, with gravity points in the big cities of the US, in Texas, in Chicago, and in Florida. In the last two, you, you recognize the kind of strong Greek presence, but that is not necessarily the driving motivator. These um, children, oh wait, sorry, sorry. Uh, and, uh, uh, Constantinus, I'll give you cues when we're up for the next slide. I'm sorry about that. So sometimes um, these children arrive as foundlings or orphans in orphanages, even though we call them orphanages, the institution in Greece is actually called Vrefokomio. So we're talking, rather young children. In um, cases that are less frequent, these children are giving up, given up by their birth mothers, very often widowed, a widowed birth father or a widowed birth mother in times of great distress, when clearly the family saw no other option. You can already tell that these are an area of adoptions that shouldn't have happened because under better circumstances, a widowed mother would not have given up a child. In a second geographical movement flow, 600 or uh, Greek children go to the Netherlands and their adoptions date from the early 1960s all the way through 1975. Those are perhaps the least known I dare say that the 3,000 that went to, to the US are planning unknown as well, but the 600 that went to the Netherlands are probably the most forgotten of them all. Uh, and they too speak their language and they too write their books in Dutch, as you can see here. The, the distinction there, however, is that they don't come from all over Greece. In fact, they're kind of centralized via one institution, the Baby Center Mitera in Athens, which is still active, that has branches in other places, but kind of centralizes its um, adoptions and procedures in Athens. And we can move on. So then, uh, uh, I just ever so briefly laid out the landscape in Greece, but 
it's also important that we think of what's happening in the US. The big watershed date in this movement is 1953 with the issuance of the Refugee Relief Act. So there is the before 1953 and the after 1953. During this time, the movement changes dramatically in the course of just a few years. So then first, before 1953, we deal mainly with older children, very often male children, who are indeed orphaned and come as orphans out of the Greek Civil War. And they are wanted, if they're not wanted by their immediate extended family in Greece, they're wanted by distant uncles and aunts all over the US who are, you know, perhaps running a restaurant and can need some help and can sponsor uh, this child, this child's uh, or, or teenager coming over. So they're older, very often they're siblings. They know where they come from. They know what kind of uh, despair and tragedy has befallen the family in the 1940s. These are the real war orphans that, uh, that are actually part of a refugee and migration effort rather than an adoption effort. And, and they arrive by boat. And I find that important. They arrive to scenic Hoboken, New Jersey for a first, first encounter with the US. Not exactly um, uh, ideal. So this is a movement of family migration that has its roots in the civil war. But soon enough, this movement will change completely and will take on all the aspects of a Cold War movement. But with this first movement, is also instituted the, the language of humanitarian rescue that we've heard through all three presentations, right? That this is a, an effort of saving orphans. The AHEPA is a key developer of this, these procedures and also of that language of humanitarian rescue. That too will change as we go to our next slide. So now there is the after 1953, the Refugee Relief Act. The, the act makes it possible for Americans who by the mid 50s very much want children to adopt foreign children from Korea, Greece, Italy, Ireland, Germany, Austria, you name it. So it's not just the Greek children that are singled out, but the Greek children given that prior history are in the forefront. In fact, they are among the most sought after. But because we're now looking at American families wanting to build families in what is, after all, the American baby boom, the, amount is, the demand transforms to a demand for babies. And it doesn't matter to these uh, American families that they don't know anything about the child, that the child is a stranger to them and they are a stranger to the child as long as the child is healthy. And so these children, with no prior preparation, whether for the child or for the parents, go to just about any white US middle class family. There is a, a preference on the Greek part that these children would go to Greek Americans. The mediaries, the, the, the go-betweens make promises to that effect. In reality, a whole different scenario uh, unfolds and just about any American citizen in a heterosexual married relationship who is white and can afford, can apply for a Greek child. And that is indeed what happens. So that means we're talking about a large majority of children that are 100% genetically Greek who are now growing up as Baptist, Southern, Jewish, uh, you name it, uh, just about any ethnicity and identification, but their roots lie in Greece. So in, in terms of the Omoyenia, which is actually a very family inspired term, they're somewhat lost to the Greek culture because they hardly had any exposure to it unless they grew up in, let's say, close communities in Chicago or, let's say, Tarpon Springs. And these people arrive by plane. So these are, uh, uh, these are also because they're kind of the new, dare I say, jet setting uh, emblems of an adoption movement. There's a tremendous amount of publicity in the, uh, in the local and larger American newspapers about these children arriving. And you can see that TWA doesn't stop short of advertising their assistance in this project, which of course for a researcher is great material, but I also feel that these children are a bit used as poster children. Uh, yes, please, Constantinos. 
So then we need to, to talk numbers. And again, we've already struggled with establishing numbers. But after, there I say, close to 10 years of research, my best number is still 3,200 children uh, whose, whose fates actually have never been known or studied. They were only kind of casually talked about or they show up in, in Greek TV shows or so looking for their roots, but they were always defined as isolated cases. It's important to see them as part of a mass adoption movement that had procedures and, and, uh, and um, uh, mediators to it. Now, it's important to compare that number to the Korean adoptions, adoptions of children uh, from Korea to the US, which rank higher in number. And so immediately your reaction is, oh, Greece is at least, at the very least, not the highest. Well, not so quick. When we uh, do a proportionate calculation, knowing that Greece has only one fourth of the total population of Korea at the same time, then Greece proportionately far surpasses the Korean adoptions. And this, this should really kind of take a moment to sink in because we associate Cold War and post-war uh, adoption, international adoption, because this is indeed the, the making of that phenomenon of international adoption that is with us to this day, we, co we correlated with Korean adoptions, GI babies arriving in the US. That is not true. Proportionally, in the first years, more Greek children arrive. They're uh, racially not visible, if I may say it like that. And they are also not GI babies because at this moment we're not dealing with a huge American presence. In fact, DNA shows that hardly ever is any of these children the product of an American serviceman and a Greek woman. So soon enough, we see some sort of a celebrity adoption culture emerge around the Greek adoptees. And Danny Kay gets into the game and Jane Russell gets into the game. So these are celebrity adoptions and publicity at the expense of Greek adoptees long before Angelina Jolie. What is important then is that these Greek children are wanted for several reasons. First of all, the demand is huge. The American demand is insatiable. There are lots of people in line constantly to adopt children that are white. The Greeks follow, fall in that category. And ideally, they want children without a history. So very young children that can be that can come into a new society as blank slates. And yes, there is a little bit of a prestige of Greece involved with it, but the most important factors of preference are white, young girls, for the sentimental value of it all, and then easily available. And that is where the Greek state actually did a lot of um, uh, 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 facilitating for these adoptions to happen fast, and there I say sometimes too fast. And the next slide, please, Constantino. So then who are these mediators? The HIPAA kind of invents the blueprints and, and is in this, in this uh, child migration and child adoption mass movement uh, already in the first negotiations of 1948 and carries this through all through the 1950s. They have the lion's share here. Unfortunately, uh, things don't, don't stay as charitable and as pristine as I would want them to be. A few leaders of the AHEPA, whose names you see mentioned, engage in what we are mildly calling irregularities. Uh, some sort of a system develops whereby you can pre-order your baby and you would have to meet very, very few qualifications. The AHEPA takes care of the rest. And a few AHEPA leaders actually make a pretty penny of this, which is why uh, the movement continues. This, this become to, becomes so problematic already in the course of a few years that in May 1959, we see the Scopas scandal emerge. And that rocks the whole pattern a little bit, but it doesn't stop it. What happens then is other people fill a vacuum as soon as the AHEPA presidents withdraw. And that is PICPA, the Greek Welfare Association, uh, a lawyer team by the name of Issachar, the baby center Mitera that tries to do things on a more procedural pattern. And Constantinus, we move to the rest. Yeah. There is one priest in Texas who on his own has uh, uh, accountability for about 80 to 90 adoptions on his own, 
which explains the concentration in Texas. And then there are, of course, a multi-country agencies such as the International Adoption Service, who at least all the way through the 1950s clamor, clamor with loud voices for better procedures. And better procedures here means preparation, casework, and screening of the families where these children are headed, because a lot of tragedies could have been avoided if all the people with, dare I say, alcohol and substance abuse and um, patterns of abusive relationships could have been ruled out. As it happened, though, the main criterion for being approved was the financial criterion. So that means that screening was done on a very minimal level and that some people still bear the mental scars of that. And then you have some smaller players, but they don't change the major picture, including some travel agents who get into the game. So clearly this is by the late fifties, a lucrative uh, enterprise and more than one person wants a piece of the adoption pie. Yes, please. Now I've done a lot of work in daily newspapers from all over the US and the, the announcements of Greek orphans arriving are everywhere. And, and I don't want to linger over them. They speak for themselves and you can actually, you know, hold the presentation still and read the quotations for yourself. What I want to emphasize is that these people who are now in their 60s and 70s and have questions and are sometimes still searching and putting all the pieces together have also gathered up the courage to write their own story. And here is Maria Heckinger, one of the AHEPA adoptees with her book, Beyond the Third Door. Next slide, please. So some more quotations. In a lot of these quotations, uh, there is this underlying rhetoric that because the child moves from poverty to wealth, from poor Greece to rich America, everything else is good. Add a little bit of love and all will work itself out. Unfortunately, that's not the case. That's not, that the recipe is not complete, obviously. And there is also some sort of a weird emphasis on a lack of hygiene in Greece and supposedly hygiene is being rediscovered in America. Anybody who's ever dealt with a Greek housewife should be able to contradict that, right? Yes, please. So the real problem then, which I have actually uh, boldened here in this quote from Amarillo, Texas from 1960, is that some of these parents actually boast in public, in print, that they couldn't qualify uh, for the welfare services in their state. And therefore they found the easy way out to turn elsewhere, to turn to Europe. And that means to turn to Greece. Yes, please. And so here are then some of these stories. Um, one woman from uh, up north in Greece writes her story of how she was placed uh, in Los Angeles in a very dysfunctional family and finds her way back to Greece after 15 years. In the middle of the book by a Dutch woman who met her mother, but but the shame of being an illegitimate child and then also an unwed mother who had given birth to this illegitimate child, very much of a taboo in Greece and very often the reason as to why a child was relinquished. Uh, the, the, the kind of, um, the difficulty of drilling down to what really happened is very difficult and is an ongoing process for almost each adoptee individually. And the last book shows you that some of these people have a lot of um, you know, strong feelings about what happened here, especially since this was not entirely an altruistic enterprise. There was indeed some money involved. And then moving on to the next slide, here is a Dutch book, 400 pages about the adoption of a girl found in that little niche there on the island of Crete in the Yeroni Macchio orphanage and eventually growing up as a Dutch person. And of course, it's it, needless to say, there are no large Greek communities in the Netherlands. These people are for all practical reasons as Dutch as they get. It's just that they don't look the part, you know, they are genetically Greek. So then I wanna add with some, end with some action points and especially in the presence of a fellow Gator and Congressman. There is, yes, there is a law that says adoptees 
can access their records. It is a toothless law. It exists since 1996 in Greece. In practice, however, it is an uphill battle for every single adoptee to access the records. And they have to jump through hoops and committees and translations and apostilles and you name it. This should be a much easier process. Nobody is into this kind of really difficult bureaucratic search for the sheer fun of it. These people have every right to knowing what there is to be known about their identity, especially 70 years after the fact. So there is a huge need for Greece to really look at this mass movement to investigate it properly. And I want to say quickly that Greece is actually falling behind. The Irish, the Swiss, the Dutch, the Chileans and the Spanish are all very far along with their government investigations. Greece is falling a little bit behind and it doesn't have to be because the expertise exists. Uh, in fact, I'm happy to help that. Uh, and, and I'm an outsider, so that helps. So uh, yes, easier access to uh, records in some sort of a streamlined way. And then these people have a huge desire to reconnect whether they grew up Greek or not. They would love, many of them would love to have dual citizenship. Again, they're kind of going up the, you know, climbing the steep uphill battle of trying to establish their Greek citizenship. If in the 1950s and 60s, these adoptees were adopted out by the courts of Athens, Thessaloniki, Iraklio, and you name it, and were given out by the Greek state as Greek citizens over which over whose adoptions the Greeks wanted to decide themselves, meaning if they were Greek enough, even as foundlings for the Greek state back then, which they were, and they have the Greek passport to prove it, then there is no reason why this should be such a laborious fight to regain that second citizenship. And it should not be an individual fight, it should be a collective initiative. And if I may talk about it strategically, it would actually be, be quite a handsome infusion in the ailing Greek economy right now because these people are eager to go back and reacquaint their whole family that they have built with the origins that are Greek. That's all I have to say on the subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gonda, for that. Um... Very, you know, very interesting uh, presentations over a long period of time, obviously. We could only focus on certain aspects uh, of this particular uh, issue, and certainly it requires a lot of additional uh, research. Uh, Gonda, as you know, uh, we, did, we did have, and for, for those who may not know, but I think some of our, a lot of our audience knows, we did have an event that had to do with uh, the 200th anniversary of the Hellenic Revolution, and one of the things we try to do is discuss uh, the aspect of dual citizenship and how do you get, how do you become a dual citizenship, uh, a, a dual citizen of Greece? Because, you know, by Greek law, you know, uh, if your parents, if your grandparents, etc., uh, were uh, Greek citizens, you have by law uh, the uh, opportunity to become a dual a dual citizen. One of the issues that was brought up, and uh, quite frankly, when I was having the discussion with the with the fellow in uh, Athens, who who actually was the uh, the head of the uh, of the uh, program in Greece, uh, he brought up the issue of of what we call the art. He called it uh, Article Ten, and mm -hmm. and that has to do, that has to do with uh, you know obviously issues like that where someone cannot necessarily uh, trace their exact parent. But in fact, there are records that indicate that uh, that they came from Greece. Obviously, you know, we we named this thing, uh, you know, uh, orphans taken abroad. I mean, what one of the issues that that I had uh, is a lot of these orphans, including from the revolution, were taken abroad. Were taken abroad in many cases, obviously, to be saved and all the rest of that. But also, but also, they came into other families. They came into other families, other religions, other cultures, and things of that nature. Many of them changed their names. Many of them disappeared, disappeared within society. So uh, the interest obviously is uh, the more recent interest because obviously, you know, we can't go back, although we do need to do research on what happened to those children and their, and their parents and their, you know, and their children and all the rest of that. And the same thing obviously with the, uh, with the genocide. But the more, recent, uh, the more recent people, many of them who are alive right now, we, we do absolutely have to do something 
both both in both in Greece and 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 obviously in the in the United States of America. Uh, these are things that we have to sort out to a certain degree. I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, Ganda. Obviously, there were some very bad cases in terms of some people, in terms of their adopted parents, but but there were also some, you know, some great things that happened to people with the families that that uh, that adopted them. But regardless, people want to find out who they are. Exactly. And and we owe it we owe it to to the children mm -hmm. uh, that were recently uh, adopted, 50s, 60s that are still alive. For those who are who are pursuing their roots, we owe it to them to attempt to help them out. With that, I want to open up the discussion a little bit and just uh, and just have a little bit of dialogue. We ran a little bit over on the presentations, but if it's okay with everyone, if you can stay here for a few minutes, let's continue the discussion because I think this is a fascinating discussion uh, that uh, requires you know more more uh, uh, more beyond this. We'll have another event maybe to go into deeper into this. But, hey, uh, doctor, uh, doctor, look, yes, yes. look, hey, I, I, I have to jump off. But uh, again, uh, I'm very, very interested in this subject. And these are great presentations. I have one question and then uh, I've got an ob family obligation that I have to meet. And we're okay. all about family, right? Uh, Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Dr. Uh, Vinstein, uh, go Gators. And uh, I was involved in the Greek studies program. In the I early know. 80s. Yeah, and uh, wonderful people. Uh, uh, Dr. Michopoulos, I guess, Kara Lisa, and many mm -hmm. others too. Thanks for all your good work. I just had one question. You think the impediment, this might have something to do with it? I was always told that the old way amongst Greeks, now this could be uh, Southern Europe, I'm not really sure, is that uh, we never told, uh, the Hellenes never told their children especially if they were adopted, you know, as infants, mm -hmm. that they were adopted. Uh, and then the kids, unfortunately, find out accidentally yeah. from someone else. Do you think that has something to do with the fact that we're behind with regard to this? Because uh, I think everyone should have a right to their identity. Has things changed? Uh, you know, before, you know, when, when I was growing up, that's the way the tradition was, uh, that the kids were not told. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I wanted to know that. And I did have read up about you a little bit, too. How that child that went over to that particular village uh, and, and the priest announced that we have an obligation of duty to get the identity of the child, the, the, the relations and what have you. Uh, I have, have was he satisfied? Did he actually get a chance to meet his his relatives, his blood relatives? That is still pending, but I'm going to use that, in, that example to answer your okay. question. Okay. In uh, a year and a half ago, we traveled to Patras, which is where most of the Patras, children yeah. come from. And we went back to the church where one of our American adoptees of Greek descent was left on the steps in 1954. And so we went back to the church and I, I, I do the Greek speaking for them because most of them don't speak Greek. And so, uh, so I thought, you know what, we're here anyway, we're, we can't miss this opportunity, let's find the oldest priest of the congregation and see if maybe um, a mother ever came back or, you know, said something on her deathbed. So we find the oldest priest on the Thursday before the Epitaphios, before Good Friday, and this man says, why don't I make an announcement in the Epitaphios service on Good Friday before the whole congregation? Because we have a responsibility. This child was found on the doorstep of this church. We need to give back. He's likely from our community. Forget the taboos and the shame. This issue has been pending for 65 years. We better do something about it. And I could not believe my ears. I, I couldn't believe it. And I thought, Okay, we'll be there tomorrow for the epitaphios. And sure enough, that's what he did. And there was this sense of serenity that, yes, we can finally talk about it. The church is not judging this. This issue has pained mothers, uh, you know, uh, adoptive parents who want to be helpful in their children's search. And it has eaten up the adoptee themselves. Like, why was I left on a, on a step, you know, in November in 19... 54. It needs to be resolved. It's lasted long enough. And it's not an issue of loyalty to one set of parents over another or to one ethnicity over another. It's more the kind of existential question. Where do I come from? How am I genetically vulnerable? 
especially now that we're all beleaguered by a pandemic. And what am I handing down to my children that I don't know of? Because if I'm adopted, my children are still somewhat adopted too, all right? So this is not a question that kind of ends with one person finding the answer. Some people can still hope to find a birth mother, but they would be so happy if they could only find, you know, half siblings, cousins, or, or just a more meaningful connection with the country that is ultimately theirs. Congressman, just Absolutely. one thing before, before you head out, before you head out, because it related to a question that you were asking uh, initially, and I cut you off. And that question had to do with uh, relations uh, uh, of Americans and the American government with regards to the Ottoman Empire and, uh, and uh, continuing. So, so the, the answer is that, right. that uh, the Americans, the Americans were, uh, were uh, merchants were dealing with the Ottoman Empire early on before the Hellenic Revolution. And even though Do uh, Do uh, Constantine uh, Hadzi Dimitrio was talking about the Greek fire that took place within the United States and the Greek committees that were formed around the revolution. And we're talking hundreds of people, hundreds of people were involved throughout the United mm -hmm. States. The American public was, was on the Hellenic side during the Greek revolution. However, the government, because of the merchants that were involved in dealing with Turkey, or, or not Turkey, but the Ottoman Empire at that particular time, uh, convinced, convinced the, the president of the U.S., Monroe, who was, who was leaning towards the Hellenic side, to in fact not be involved with the, uh, with the uh, revolutionaries and all the rest of that. However, as we indicated with the USS Constitution and other things, there was in fact some help towards Greece by the U.S. government. But that policy, that policy from, from before the Hellenic Revolution into the revolution and beyond that, that case of the American public being with the Hellenic people in the Hellenic nation versus, versus the government and whether they sided with Turkey or Greece, the American government has always sided, I hate to say this, on the Turkish side because of mercantile reasons and other geostrategic issues, regardless of, pa of, pa of parties. And we're talking about a period of over 200 years. That was my comment. Demet you yeah, know, yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, we're, we're, going to, we're going to try to change that. And uh, lately, things have gotten a little better uh, for Elada with regard to that. But you're absolutely right, and it's really a shame. Like, I was going to comment some things haven't changed when you talked about uh, that. But the, the American people, their heart has always been with Greece. So uh, I agree. And listen, the, the presentations, and I'm going to get off right now because I don't want to monopolize the time either. But uh, the presentations... Uh, were outstanding. And I'd well, love to continue to keep in touch with you. And also, uh, if I can help on the congressional level, please do not hesitate, because this is uh, something very close to my heart. Well, absolutely. And we love what you do with regards to not only the, the region, not only the Hellenic Republic, but also with the upcoming or this year's anniversary of the 200th anniversary yeah. of the Hellenic Revolution. And we're so proud that you're a member of our committee, the American Hellenic Bicentennial Committee, because a lot of the things that we're doing relate to America. In other words, some right. of the discussions we were having earlier about the orphans, the next presentation will be about, about the Greek Revolution and its effects on the, on the American abolitionist movement. And there we're gonna discuss some real serious things of how, um, how the Greek Revolution and what happened there helped really the abolitionist movement of the United States. And that's gonna be during Black History Month. And then the right. month after we're gonna discuss how the Hellenic Revolution affected the women's suffrage movement in the United States of America. Wow, that's, that's great stuff. I'd love to participate. And I appreciate it very much. This was very informative. We're gonna try to get the prime minister here as well uh, to do a joint session of Congress. Uh, That's wonderful. So I'm, I'm, I'm working on that as well. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thanks for thank joining you, us. Thank you again thank for you. joining and us. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. Thank you both. Yes. yes. Okay, so let me, let me ask you guys a couple of questions then if I can. Okay, uh, uh, we, we discussed a little bit about the, uh, the Ottoman Empire and, uh, and Americans and all the rest of that, Constantine, but we'll come back to the orphans in one second. Uh, if we can, Theo, let's let's discuss a couple of a uh, couple of issues uh, with regards to the orphans. Uh, uh, obviously, obviously, you mentioned that uh, many of these orphans ended up 
these were these were orphans basically where they killed their parents. The same people who killed their parents sometimes took them in and Turkified them, as as you said. Uh, are we having a similar thing happening that Gonda was talking about with regards to those particular orphans who were taken, you know, taken and 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 um, uh, Turkified as they grew up? Did they start to discover that they were also Hellenic people? And what happened with that? In other words, do we have anything with regards to that of what Gonda was talking about, but now a little bit different in a different nation and in a different circumstance? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, there are cases um, uh, from uh, orphan uh, childs who ended up in uh, Muslim families, Turkish families, or uh, in Turkish orphanages, and then um, uh, were given in uh, Turkish families. And when they grow up, uh, uh, they, they, they discovered uh, their true origins. They searched uh, for their um, roots and found that the their, their origins are Greek, uh, from, they have Greek origins. Uh, what is in, interesting enough is that uh, there is a, I cannot call it a wave, but there are several cases now fr uh, from people in Turkey, uh, especially in the Pontus area, uh, that they know uh, that they have uh, Greek uh, roots. And uh, there is a, a, a master thesis uh, is written already about this issue from a grandchild uh, of one of these families. Now, this uh, student is now preparing his doctorate with the same subject, how um, uh, Turkish uh, people uh, found out that the, they, are, they have Greek origins. The thing is, when you find it out, what, what do you do with that? What do you, what's, what's what is the decision uh, for your life after you find out that you have Greek origins? It's not easy to, to answer uh, to this question because uh, these people have a, a, a level uh, uh, in, in their community that they don't want to uh, interrupt uh, and they don't want to, uh, although always they find the way uh, to have the connections uh, with uh, with their Greek relative, the Greek relatives. So we have some cases where they visited Greece in order to find their relatives. And uh, the story of Tamama, for example, is is, is very touching. Um, uh, she she after many years, uh, when she were seventy years old, she started speaking Pontic Greek. So the rest of the family didn't know what was this uh, dialect. And she asked to be, um, she came to Greece and uh, finally she was able to find his lost brother. And the, the moment in, the, in this uh, film is very touching. Uh, we have cases, we have young scholars who are searching these uh, uh, subjects, scholars from Tur Turkey, and this is important. And uh, we are, waiting to see how how this uh, this issue will will continue it's very it's very interesting because uh, as i mentioned before a lot of us are are uh, you know in with uh, for for a long time with uh, uh, with genealogy groups and uh, obviously uh, a lot of things are taking place in that arena especially with dna and all the rest of that and uh, certainly there's been a lot of uh, you know people who start doing dna in turkey all of a sudden, they they come into into a state of shock when they find out because everybody's everybody's trained or was born you know from the time they're born that uh, you know a Turk is a Turk and all the rest of that, and uh, certainly with the philosophies that came out uh, you know the uh, you know by Gopak and uh, and all the rest of them uh, philosophical aspects of uh, you know Turk being a Turk and and all that and then people get totally shocked because because it's negative to be something else sometimes in uh, Especially in nationalistic uh, oriented uh, environments. Luke, so, can I they, ask you a question? No, please jump on. Jump on, yeah, guys. Uh, the, uh, I, I've read, and uh, he, he'll be able to verify uh, or discuss this that uh, Erdogan himself 
is of Pontic origin. And there's documentary evidence uh, from um, his uh, village uh, that shows uh, this. Is there any truth to that? Of course there is. <laughs> Uh, they they say that the, his origins uh, come from Potamnia, a uh, small village in uh, Lazistan area. When the, the, the thing is, the, what he answered when a uh, uh, journalist asked him this question, if you have uh, a Greek origin, he said, uh, my grandfather said, uh, when you die, Allah will ask you if you was a good if you were a good Muslim and not if you were a Greek or, or a, a Turkish. Uh, so, from this answer, you can understand that something is there. Something is, uh, but of course, you know, it's 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 uh, when when the Turks uh, want to curse uh, someone, they say you are a Armenian or you are a Greek. It's it's like a uh, they want to. Uh, it's. I mean, uh, if you are, if you uh, reveal that you have Greek or Armenian origins in something that is not acceptable in the society, it, it or, uh, and most importantly in the Anatolia, we don't speak about the Stamp uh, Constantinople, Istanbul, Zmirni, or or uh, even Ankara. In in Anatolia, things are different. Many years ago, when I took Ottoman history, uh, the uh, Turks in the, the class did not know that I was a Greek at first. And uh, they used to refer to Greeks and Armenians as subject people. Well, it's all, it's, it's all very interesting. It's all very interesting. The, uh, <laughs> I, let me, let, Constantine, let me, let me ask you a question. Uh, you, know, you, you mentioned a diary, certainly. You mentioned Evangelidis' diary, and you mentioned also uh, uh, Castanius' diary, The Greek Exile. Can you just go a little bit uh, deeper, if you can, uh, into those diaries a little bit? And then, and then I'll ask a question of Gonda for, for something that's uh, kind of important for us right now. Well, those diaries are fascinating because what they do is they give you the mechanism for uh, why, why uh, these uh, uh, orphans, uh, refugees, were actually there and how they were used. Uh, they uh, make it clear that uh, uh, Castanis, for example, and uh, Evangelides, they uh, went on a lecture circuit. They were there to raise money. Uh, they were there to help the relief effort. And so, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Howe actually took them around the country uh, and, um, as props. So uh, they would dress up in their fustanillas and, uh, and, and give lectures. And uh, it was a fundraising operation. Uh, what's also interesting is that uh, for themselves, for their own education, they were sponsored by individuals, but they were also sponsored by groups, by committees. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we read from uh, the diary of uh, Evangelides, that's why it's so valuable, you don't get that depth, that in, uh, in, in his case, uh, the church, uh, the Protestant church that he uh, uh, was associated with created what they called the Evangelese uh, Society. And the purpose of that was to uh, raise funds and support him in addition to the family that he lived with, very wealthy family, the Wards, uh, Julia Ward, of course, uh, who uh, later married Howe and uh, wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic. So you have these connections and you have really a program that's systematic. Uh, and we don't have the, the level of information. Castanis, uh, he says the same thing, that he went around lecturing uh, and it was done in a systematic way. Uh, we, we don't have that level of detail from any of the others as far as I know. So uh, they are uh, very valuable from that point of view. Also, what's interesting is that they, uh, apparently they also, there was a network of these uh, these uh, individuals. So they wrote to each other. They knew where so-and-so was. In fact, the, the number that, um, that uh, is often quoted about how many there were comes from Castanis. He, he says that there were 40, two scores. But we, th we, th we suspect, and I'm fairly sure because I've uncovered others, that there were probably more. But mm -hmm. um, there was a, a network of these individuals 
also that they worked together and supported each other. Absolutely. Thank, no, no, thank you for that. And, and there's so much missing with regards to that. And thank you so much for, for discussing some of those things that many of us do not know. And, and I agree with you. I think there were more than 40, uh, 40 uh, orphans or not so refugees, however you want to uh, call them. And a lot of the, a lot of the people you know, who, are, who are orphaned, uh, they, they were taken to many different countries. For example, in, uh, in Chios, for example, there were thousands of orphans, I think. Uh, many of them became major, major leaders within the Ottoman Empire. One of them, I think, was a, was a governor of one of the, of the major areas in Northern Africa. So, so a lot of them became extremely prominent, like we talked about the Raleigh's brothers, for example. Uh, you know, they became extremely wealthy. Some of the other orphans became wealthy. What I found fascinating was how educated these orphans became, how they went to, to universities, to Andover, Columbia, et cetera. And uh, quite well, frankly, was, how they- It was, it was yeah. actually the exact opposite of the other waves of Greek immigrants that came much later. They started at the top. Uh, the other immigrants, uh, the pushcart vendors, etc., that came by the thousands after 1890, they started at the bottom and had to wor work their way up. So it's a, an interesting contrast. No, it's an interesting con uh, uh, contrast. And also for, for those, for the audience who's listening, the first wave of actually Hellenic people, including uh, refugees, orphans, whatever you want to call them, they were extremely wealthy in many cases. Uh, that's why you, you had, for example, many of them go down to, uh, uh, to New Orleans where they founded the first church. Uh, that's why you had establishments established in New York, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Carolina etc. In the 1840s, we're talking in the 1840s, there were major establishments that were established in, in major cities in the U.S. And, and in a few years, they controlled the cotton trade of the world. Right. of the world. Well, Not don't, just, forget, don't forget the New Smyrna colony in the 18th century in Florida. That's, that's absolutely correct. Gonda, let me ask you a question because uh, obviously you've uh, touched a nerve with all of us because uh, some of the people that we're talking about are uh, our are, are, are ages, quite frankly. Uh, Gonda, uh, what can Greece do today for its adoptees and orphans of the 50s, 60s, who are now older adults? What can, what can Greece do? Gonda, is Gonda frozen? Is Gonda with us? Uh, not maybe, time. maybe her sound is off. Uh, okay. Um, all right, let me take another, let me, let me ask uh, Theo another question. Maybe we can get Gonda on, on because I, I really would like to know the answer to that. Uh, Theo, there are, uh, many of these orphaned uh, children, I imagine, ended up in America. What happened to them? Do they, did they know their origin? Did they know who they were? There is a saying uh, written by Bruce Clark in his book, uh, Twice a Stranger. Uh, he said, uh, in the United States, there are families of Greek or Armenian descent who know uh, very well that the survival of a grandfather or great grandfather was possible due to the existence of uh, a makeshift hospital of soup kitchens set up by the American charities in the depths of Anatolia. So they, most of them know um, uh, the, the, the American uh, efforts um, to help them and to survive. Uh, so many of these orphans were given uh, to foster Christian uh, families uh, in America with their record, uh, um, the, the background, their, their history, the background. So m most of them know. But of course, there are also cases of uh, very young orphans uh, in the age uh, till five uh, years old who were adopted and raised uh, by um, the culture of the family uh, that uh, received them, that adopt them, without knowing their true origin. So, th of course, there, there are cases like that, of course. Uh, thank you. Gonda, are you back now? Yes, yes. I'm okay, sorry, let, 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 let me ask the question. Let me ask the question again. Because, because obviously you touched a nerve. You touched a nerve with all of us. Uh, because what you're discussing is, is much more modern. 
Oh, yeah. And it's here, and many, many of the many of the uh, young people are, are are alive today. In some cases, our ages, uh, you know, uh, us who are talking right now. What can Greece do today for its adoptees and orphans of the fifties, sixties, who are now older adults? Did 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 to freeze again? Yeah, she seems to have disappeared from the screen, uh, Lou. Oh my God! All right. Um... Uh, I, I really, I really need to get that answer. Uh, but regardless, you know what? We'll, we'll continue Can I ask to. Theo, a question then. Yeah, yeah. Ask me, ask me anything. Theo, uh, uh, I have a, a book uh, that um, treats the Armenians, and uh... now have we lost Constantine? Yeah, it seems so. So, so we lost Constantine. Now there's only two of us. <laughs> Remembering this. No, go ahead, Con go ahead, Constantine. Go ahead. It's just me and Theo now. Constantine, can we hear you? I don't think so. Okay. Gonda, answer the question before before you disappear. Answer the question. I'm losing. I'm... One the second, problem... Constantine. One second. Gonda, answer the question before you disappear. The problem is, Lou, I was gone while you phrased the question. So if you can briefly give me the question. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What, what can Greece do today for its adoptees and orphans of the 50s, 60s who are now older adults? Yes. Well, first of all, a proper investigation whereby they would really give access in, in some sort of a bulk way to, to the files that are uh, the adoption files, whether in the court records or in these various institutions. So a, a, a mass investigation of what is now a 70 year old adoption history on a national scale would be very, very pertinent. It's what other countries are doing. So this is nothing new. And then second, a realization that open access should indeed for the adoptee should indeed much more be much more feasible, even for those people who don't have the language. Uh, I think we lost Gunda. I think we lost Gunda. Uh, Constantine, are you on? Constantine, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear yeah, me? Can you ask the question while we wait for Gunda again uh, to uh, Theo? For adoption? Yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, hold, uh, hold it. Uh, Gunda's back. Gunda's oh, back. Go ahead. Back. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so again, an, an, a collective effort to make people's search feasible and also to, to make their path to citizenship feasible on a collective scale rather than letting everybody fight individually their uphill battle. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gonda. Constantine, you were asking Theo a question, please. Yes, I, I had a question for Theo, but I have a follow-up for Gonda. Gonda, uh, um, I, I wonder, I, a number of years ago, I did research on uh, Frideriki and what was called the uh, Vasiliki Pronya uh, during this period. Um, uh, you haven't touched upon any political aspects uh, yeah. of this whole phenomenon. Uh, are they addressed in your book? Yes, yes. I, I want to sort out a few things here. When we talk about child campaigns of whatever nature, our mind immediately goes to the pedomazoma or to the pedopolis of Frederiki. For the longest time, we thought it was some sort of an antithesis between the two, you know, and that in very charged political language. What we haven't really looked at is that there is a third prong. This is the missing link. This is the children who were given out by typically right-wing governments of the, you know, post-war era, to capitalist, anti-communist, Cold War America. So this is the big missing link of, again, 2,000 children. Now, mind you, it's also a history of the 50s, whereas Frederiki and uh, Pedro Mazuma is more of a history of the late 1940s. One logical question would then be, Gus, did the children of the pedopolis, did they become the many children that were sent to America? The answer is no, surprisingly not. So for all, I must say, a whole lot of scapegoating, a whole lot of this, you know, you read these sensationalist articles in the Greek newspaper of Frederiki earning $4,000 a head on all these adoptions. No, it doesn't check out historically. There is, there is not that overlap. Uh, and it's kind of become a little easy to scapegoat her for these 
lucrative adoptions, whereas in reality, you needed a lawyer's training to be able to do this. And so the, the, the leadership in designing this and blueprinting this is a HEPA leadership with the best of intentions in the beginning, with some... All right, we seem, we seem to have lost uh, Gonda again, and we seem to have lost Constantine, so it's just me and you, Theo. Uh, so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to just wrap it up a little bit because we've extended our time, but I will say that uh, we need to have another one of these to continue further into more detail because uh, what we've been discussing uh, for the first, um, you know, the first time maybe the way we- I'm back. It, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm not just gonna wrap it up. What I, what I was saying is that we need, we need uh, to have another one of these uh, events so we can we can basically go into a little bit more depth on, on uh, some of these issues uh, that quite frankly are new to many people. And again, uh, not enough research uh, you know, has been done uh, in terms of some of these areas. Uh, so, so to the audience, I will say that uh, this event uh, and others we have had and are being planned are part of EMCA's American Hellenic Revolution of 1821, a Bicentennial Committee series of events focusing not only on the revolution, but also importantly on the American diaspora and international aspects and influences of the revolution uh, for its 200th anniversary. Thank you to the audience and thank you certainly to the presenters today uh, for attending today's panel discussion. And uh, join, us, join us on uh, February uh, the 21st uh, during Black History Month, where we're going to have an event, EMCA is going to have an event, uh, the Hellenic Revolution and its effects on the American abolitionist movement, a panel discussion. Uh, it will be a webinar again. Uh, the panel for this unique event will include uh, author, poet, uh, professor uh, uh, Nicholas Alexiou, uh, who's also the director of the Hellenic American Project at Queens College author, historian, poet, editor, activist, Dan Georgiakis, who many of you know, uh, the director of the Greek American Studies Project at the Center for Byzantine and Modern uh, Greek Studies at Queens College, and historian, uh, author, activist, Herb Boyd, a professor of the Black Studies Program at the City College uh, of New York. Uh, we, we have uh, events that are uh, you know, different than most, uh, for those who are interested in our, our events, uh, you can uh, just go on the internet, embca.com, embca.com. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all our panelists uh, for, this, for their excellent presentations on a, on, a, on a subject that we do not discuss enough and a subject that's not researched enough. Gwanda, you did not, you did not finish, so I'm gonna allow you to finish, please. I, I was just uh, saying that we need to think of these American bound adoptions as some sort of a third prong in which to, to, to see these interferences with children and their movements by the end of the Civil War and in the early 50s. But it's definitely the least studied area and more work needs to be done, which will also give us a different kind of sense of where accountabilities lie. And then with the actions that I pointed out, both access to the record and access to dual citizenship, I feel we can still give these children some redress for a history that has been silenced for too long. Thank you. Theo, some final words from you, and then I'll go to Constantine. Some final words. Yeah, as you said, the, uh, further research is needed on this subject. And uh, uh, in several archives in the United States, uh, I, I'm sure that we will find um, a lot of uh, uh, memoirs, uh, pictures uh, of all these activities, Near East Relief, YMCA, so many organizations. Uh, yeah, this is my final word, uh, further research is needed. Constantine, wrap it up for us, uh, some final thoughts on your end. Constantine? Uh, have we lost Constantine? Oh. Yes, I just want to thank you for uh, hosting this. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I hope to work on a um, uh, research piece 
on uh, the um, uh, 1821 uh, 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 orphans uh, and their contributions. This will be my contribution to the 200th anniversary of uh, the Greek Revolution. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Uh, thank Very you. Much. Okay, thank let's you. let's do it again. Let's do it again. Thank and, you. And, thank and you by so the much. way, and, and by the way, again, uh, send me an email with regards to uh, any professors, etc., people relating to the diaspora and the and its effects on the Hellenic, uh, you know, revolution. You know, so uh, for March the seventh. Thanks, guys. You're the best. Talk bye to you bye. soon. Thank, thank you. you to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.